Okay, so hello friends, and um, today I thought I'd tackle a little bit of Vulcan on the screen. Uh, the main complaint I've seen with Vulcan is it's a pain in the ass to get going, and there's a lot of boilerplate. This is very true. It's uh, kind of the drawback of a cross-platform graphics API is you kind of have to handle every different case, and you end up with situations like this where a lot of people feel like they're the ones writing the driver and that's pretty valid um and there's a lot of great resources uh like the vulcan hello tutorial um like it takes you through the hello triangle setup and all of those things and they are fantastic um but the one thing that i found when i was doing them for the first time is you kind of didn't really know your end goal so you'd be creating things you didn't really know why you were making things and there wasn't really an end goal in sight. Um, so what I wanted to go through was Vulcan, but we start with something else and we're going to actually just forget entirely the triangle and we are going to just have a clear color. The, the triangle can come in later um, at some point. But right now, all we want to do is to get some, just anything on screen. Once you've got a thing on screen, it's going to be easier for you to get going and get other things on screen. This is the, you know, visual feedback. It's nice to be able to, it's nice to be able to see what you're making. You know, you're not just making, you're not just getting abstract objects, um, and you, it feels a bit more fulfilling, really, right? Um, and this is by no means a perfect example of what we're going to be doing today. In fact, it's explicitly not <laughs> uh, a perfect example, but more rather um, from like a Windows quite, quite newbie perspective we're going to be taking. Um, so let's exit out there. Um, got a lot of validation errors which is lovely um, so I think it's probably worth starting at the Vulcan SDK uh, this is the thing you're going to need to install um, in order to you know actually run Vulcan you need the headers and stuff like that um, so get the Vulcan SDK uh, where's the download link download the Vulcan SDK and it'll take you here, and then obviously you want to get the right one for your platform. Once you have the Vulkan SDK installed, you can navigate to that installation using the environment variable. And in the file browser, you can use percent signs. Uh, so that'll take you to your installation, check out the bin utils, and we're going to actually check that your device is capable of running Vulkan at all. Um, so run Vulcan Cube, fantastic, right? My device is now my device is Vulcan enabled. I've actually had it where I first tried to mess around with Vulcan, and my laptop just straight up didn't have Vulcan capabilities, um, and it took me ages to realise what was going on. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with a new Visual Studio project. I actually kind of hate using Visual Studio projects. They sort of really, I don't like the way you have to configure them. I prefer to use CMake, although that's still not a perfect solution either. Um, but for now, let's just make a new one, create a new project. Um, where is the console application? There we go. Vulcan example. And usually, like, this is the thing, most people are going to be more familiar with this. We're going to press F5, just make sure it works. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Um, just for reference as well, I'm going to have this pre-built example that I made earlier. You know, like Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier. Um, I'm going to start, uh, you know, right from the beginning here. We're going to be starting with Win32. Um, no... Um, yeah, no, like, um, GLFW, and that's mainly just because it's another thing to install, and that's kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, the other thing as well is I'm going to get rid of the 
CPP because I don't like CPP. Um, <laughs> we're going to use C instead, um, mainly just because I prefer C. Uh, main dot C. Much better. <laughs> Okay, so first thing I'm going to add is a little header file, a uh, new file, application.h. Uh, and this is just where I'm going to store everything, right? It makes things so much easier. Get rid of that. If not, define a VK example header. And this is just basically what your pragma turns into. If you've never used C, this is basically the equivalent of Pragma once using um, uh, definitions. And you're basically saying only enter the contents of this header if this value is not defined, and then you immediately define it after the fact. So the next time this header is pulled into source, this is defined and you don't get um, repeating values. It's, it's the point of Pragma once. Um, um, but Pragma once isn't necessarily guaranteed to be supported. Anyway, this is not important. Um, we're going to start with Win32 stuff. So struct Win32 application type def struct, remember. And we need uh, to include Windows first. Uh, if you've never worked with the Windows API. Each instance, uh... I don't think that is, uh, H. Come on, IntelliSense, confirm we now. Ah. Okay, so, H instance is basically just how you register um, you know, it's a unique identifier for your application or your DLL, it depends. Um, and then obviously a window handle because we're going to be producing a window. Uh, and that should be more or less all we need uh, for the Win3, Win32 application. Um, so we're going to go through and start with Win32. Firstly, uh, include application.h and then I'm just going to put these two side by side um, I like to leave myself some little traces uh, so and the way I find it easiest to do these things is do them in little sections. So start with, you know, register the window, open the window, stuff like that. Um, and those will all have like a return code. So int uh, startup win32, and that'll take a win32 application pointer app. Um, we also need a um, int width, int height. Um, anything else we need for our window? I don't know, not yet. Um, we need to actually give a body to this function. Uh, and Basically, I always return zero when it's successful, and um, if it's not successful, then I return some sort of error code. And I'm just going to wrap this up in a, a thing that whenever it receives zero, it tells the user and then exits. So uh, define return on fail, and it gets one value. Um, and this value goes do, um, and int return value is equal to x. Um, if return value is not equal to zero, print f. Stringify the input uh, failed with and send d to return code. Uh, right. And of course, return code. And 
point one zero. So the reason you put it in a do while loop is basically to ensure that you keep the correct scope. It means you can do this in return without um, having multiple uh, definitions for return. So you're just keeping it in that block. Um, and so turn on fail startup win32. We're not going to pass anything just yet. And has that failed? We'll see. Yes, it has. Um, expected while. It's... Ah! I'm stupid. No, that's not what I want you to do. Christ. Sometimes always online does piss me off a little bit, but it's okay. There we go. That should now work. Nice. And if we... Double check. Vulcan startup win32 null failed with return code minus one. Exactly. Lovely. Okay. Null. And this will do the same thing more or less. If um let's take a router. Do while zero. Um that's 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 the Um if x is equal to null then That just raises more questions. Sure, good weather. Um, and so let's do instead turn on no. Uh, I've spelt return wrong. Fuck's sake. Cool. So app is not allowed to be null, uh, and I forgot to return an error code. Uh, return minus one. Cool. App is not allowed to be null. Startup win32 failed with return code minus one. Fantastic. Uh, so that's our utility macro setup. Um, so, you know, let's give this some values. Uh, so, uh, win32 application, uh, win, two, and this is why I like C, I can do this. Uh, and I believe this is coming into, uh, C++ 20 something or other i'm not entirely sure but the variables need to be in order and that i don't like either uh width uh what's good width 720 with a height of 480 yeah there we go and now we shall instead pass a pointer to that application cool nice so that's all of our macro setup needed or all of the macro setup that we did need let's now actually <laughs> start up our win32 application i'm gonna yank this over here for reference because win32 is evil and um i hate it and it makes me want to cry okay so start when 32 so usually when you use windows or you want to make a graphics application in windows you don't actually use the in main entry point instead you use the what's called w main entry point and it uses a different linker setup and it stops this terminal from spawning 
Um, and that's very useful if you are making a release version of a Win32 application, but in this case, we're actually wanting this terminal for debug uh, purposes. So we're just using the usual int main. And when you use the W main, you actually get handed the application handle. But in this case, I we haven't got it, so we need to do get uh module handle sorry it's modules everything's a module and we pass null and that gives us the h instance so app uh app instance equals that and once you then have um uh an application handle the way windows works is you first have to register the window class within the operating system and then you can create instances of that window class kind of like object oriented programming but instead you're using the operating system and you use a string identifier which is kind of a pain in the ass but Let's go from there, window class, wind, um, and it's probably a good idea to uh, mem set this to zero instead of using the curly brace initializers. Um, the reason we need to do that is because there's a bunch of other stuff in the window class that we're not going to be touching, and I don't want to set a bunch of the other fields in this struct manually to do it. Instead, I'm going to uh, set them to zero by using, you know, uh, a mem set. Okay, so let's actually give these some values. Uh, long pointer string, uh, I don't know what the Z's for, uh, class name. So this is the unique identifier which is used um, by the operating system to identify the class when we want to make uh, an instance of it. So uh, usually something nice, window class, uh, Vulcan example application, doesn't have to be this long. I don't even know if these need to be unique per like globally or if it's just per like per application. I think per application probably makes a lot more sense. But anyway, uh, window dot h instance, um, app, app instance, uh, win dot long pointer to long pointer to a window proc address. So this is the function pointer that we have to give to Windows to enable Windows to process the the events it's coming. We haven't actually got one of those yet, so let's make that a null pointer. Now, obviously, this means this isn't going to work, but we'll come back to this in a little bit. And style. Uh, let's see. Uh, these are just enums for style. I don't know what they do, to be honest, but it's not really important. Um, <laughs> and so now, what do you want? Cast between systematically different strings, use of an invalid string, can you? Okay, um, does that fix that? Sometimes that does. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, now we need to try and register it. Um, so register class, uh, and a, a pointer to the window class that we're trying to register. Yep. Uh, and so we're taking the null here, um, because, uh, if we get a, if this fails, so this will fail. Peak definition, yeah, 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 uh, peak definition, window class, okay, this doesn't really tell me anything, okay, never mind, um, basically, if this fails, we actually want to tell the user, so printf fail to I 
think this should fail if I remember correctly. Nope. Okay. So even though the window class won't actually work, it still registers. So if you actually try and create an instance of this window, you should find um, that it doesn't work. So I mean, let's do that, right? Let's create an instance of our window. Uh, blah, 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 and that returns uh, a window handle. So we want to store that. And this is where you have uh, an absolute shit ton of parameters. So remember, we have this class name. So probably should abstract that or at least put it in a define. Uh, but we're not going to do that. Uh, name. So that's, you know, the thing that appears on your, you know, window, you know, handlebar, I guess. Um, draw style. What draw styles do I need? Um, overlappable window. So it's not like a pop-up. It's not um, uh, like an always on the front window. It's just a regular window. Uh, the X position. So that's where it starts up. Uh, it's usually easy just to say like our oh, default position and I think that defaults in the center of the screen. I'm not really sure. Um, just let the operating system handle that. We don't care. Um, however, we do care about the width and the height. Um, and so what are the other fields? The other fields are, we have a parent window. So this is actually the, the root window. Well, it's not the root window, it's its own window. It doesn't have a parent, so null. Um, and doesn't have a menu, but it does have an H instance. Um, and we're not putting in any user data. So that is also once again, null. What do you want? Cast between two systematically. What? Okay. That just... Whatever. It's just a warning. We'll ignore it. Um, and so whenever this window fails, if like the creation of this window fails, we'll actually get a null pointer. So although this was initially only designed for capturing, if the user is passed a null pointer, we can just... Okay, so now I think that should fail. Oh. Okay, well it has, but not how I thought. <laughs> Uh, probably th that, right? If I were to have, I guess. Yes, it was that. Okay, cool. Um, and the creation of our window has failed. Nice. Um, and I suspect that is most likely um, either because the class name isn't correct, like here, um, or it's because it hasn't got a window proc address. Now, I think it's most likely going to be that it doesn't have a window proc address. Uh, window proc address is the thing that we need um, in order to handle events. And it has a very specific function pointer um, or function signature, sorry. Um, so we have to use we don't have to make it static, but there's no point in making it globally accessible. Uh, wind proc. And it takes a, a H wind window handle, a U int message handle, a W param. an L param, I believe. Okay. And that's the function signature of um, 
the application or, or rather the proc address function and it basically allows your user to, or the user, i.e. us, we're the user of the API. It allows us to intercept events that we've received from the operating system or that our window has received from the operating system. And for those that we don't really want to do any sort of special interception with, uh, we can just use the default situation, which window provides to us with a something called the death window proc. Um, and we just pass these, these um, we just need to you know, pass this on basically. Um, cool. And um, so let's add that. No, okay. I'm gonna try and get rid of that. Okay. Well, that's annoying. <laughs> it was. It was the text thing. And I imagine it's because uh, the Windows API is very backwards compatible. It has to support both um, Unicode and multibyte string, uh, different ways of doing it. Um, and text basically puts it into always the one that the platform is currently using um anyway not important uh what is important though is you may have noticed our window was created but it wasn't created you know where's our window there isn't one uh, and that's because we actually have to tell the operating system to then show the window uh, so I am in the wrong screen. That's not very PogChamp. Uh, so, and so now whenever we need to reference this window, we can actually just use this handle here, uh, n command show. Obviously we want a non, non zero value because we actually want to show the window. And then we have to tell the operating system that we're updated something about the window. Um, There we go. And you might have noticed that it flashed up incredibly briefly. And that's because we're not doing any handling of the messages. We're just open a window and immediately the program's finished running its course. You know, it's done. Um, that's fine um, for now. Um, but, you know, we're calling directly into the Windows API. We're calling directly, we're communicating directly with the operating system. And that's pretty cool. Uh, next, we're going to start actually intercepting those calls and keep looping over and over again. Okay, so then, um, let's actually handle the messaging loop. Uh, so we've got our good window here. That's all fantastic. Um, so let's enter into the windowing loop. And there's a, a very specific way that this is usually handled, uh, at least within Windows. Um, and it's it's called through, you have to physically get the next message in the queue. So you have a buffer of messages, which you have yet to process. And then you can then look at that uh, message and then start processing it. Now, the easiest way to do that is with uh, get message. However, that will stop the process. Uh, it'll block until a new message comes in. And that means you basically can't escape this messaging loop. So instead, there's something called peak, which will return null if um, something else has happened. Uh, or if there's no, <sighs> so the difference is peak message will actually return null if there are no messages left for the window to actually read. However, get message will just wait until the message comes in. We actually want to be doing other things in our frame. And to be honest with you, I don't really get the point of get message. I mean, you want to be able to do other things while your program's running right. Um, so 
at the very least, let's um, start off with some sort of variable like int uh, keep open. Well, and this is just, you know, keep the window open. Uh, so, and we'll need something that changes this value eventually. But for now, we're just going to constantly keep it open. So if you remember from earlier, we need um, a message. Uh, and so this is just a variable to hold the contents of this message that we're going to send here. Um, and we're going to do this in a while loop. Uh, peak message. Uh, message. And we don't care actually what handle it's going to. And the reason why is because if we limit our scope of the messages we're listening to to be just the actual window handle, then we won't be able to re uh, receive the close button being pressed. And we won't be able to do anything. We won't be able to exit this loop when the close button is pressed, which we want to be able to do. Um, there's no filter. B zeros. Um, we don't want to apply any filters. And this next one is, do you want to remove the message from the buffer? And we do, right? Um, otherwise, we'll just be reading the same message over and over and over again. And um, now we have to translate the message. Um, I don't really know what the point of these two calls are. And now we have to dispatch the message. And that will now go and send that message over to our window proc. Um, so now if we load, oh, would you look at that? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to be honest. I don't think I titled... <laughs> I don't think that's the correct title for my window, you know. Um, <laughs> that's so ridiculous. Anyway, um, but as you saw there, we actually do have a window and it's staying open. But when we press close, our application's not ended. It's still going. And you can see from the memory over here that nothing's been released. Um... Sorry, that's actually really funny. Um, why why has that happened? Is it because of this, maybe? It should just be... Yeah, okay, cool. Um, whatever. <laughs> that's so ridiculous. Um, anyway. Uh, okay, so... As you saw there, we didn't actually... Um, we, we didn't actually exit, but if we put a breakpoint, we're hitting it in here. And if we look at the call stack, uh, okay, never mind. I, I actually thought the call stack would show things from the kernel. Oh, a little bit, maybe. No, never mind. Uh, it just comes up as external code. I thought it would maybe list the kernel in the, in the call stack. Um, but it does not. Anyway, so here we're going to actually want to intercept the message. So if that message that we received is, oh, I don't know, what message is useful? Uh, window manage quit. Fantastic. Um, we're going to set keep open to zero. And we're going to break out of the messaging loop because We've received a quit message. There's nothing else left for us. Um, but most likely you'll see that it's still not closing. And that's because we're not actually receiving the window manage quit message. That's not sent by the operating system. Instead, we need to handle a destroy request here. Um, so instead, you would need to go down to the window prop. Uh, switch, uh, message, value, default break, yeah, um, 
case. Win uh window manage destroy. Yep. And you need to now post a quit message. And it's actually this post quit message which will then send this window manage quit event. And look at that. Fantastic. Our application opens and closes. What more could you possibly want? <laughs> okay, so one thing that was really bothering me <laughs> was the um, formatting. I've actually moved the uh, my personal Clang format file in. So we just need to, there we go, much better. Uh, and to reduce the clutter, we're going to add another file, new item, wins32.c. Thank you very much. Not. Uh, and we're just going to put those in here, really. We're just going to yoink those function definitions out. Put them in here. Let me just make sure. Cool, lovely. And I think that is the end of the window setup, or at least the Win32 setup. I think I think that is actually the end of the Win32 setup. Um, so next, we're going to move over to Vulkan. Huh. OK, so either you followed along my horrible Win32 tutorial, or you've got your own, or you've got GLFW, or whatever. Right, um, so let's get on with the actual Vulkan setup. So you're going to want to go to Solution Explorer, your example, right click properties, um, and usually this will be collapsed. You want to head into the linker, all options, and then it's just easier to search for additional. Um, so additional library directories, that is, you know, where can the linker go looking for Vulkan? And if you go to your Vulkan SDK directory, uh, you'll find it all inside of lib. Uh, we want to link to this Vulkan-1.lib. Um, and while we could just use that, that's not going to work very well for you know other people. Maybe they've installed Vulkan somewhere else. Maybe they've got a different version. So in Visual Studio, you can access the environment variables using the dollar sign and round brackets. This is more similar to POSIX, and I don't know why there's this strange discrepancy. Um, but once again, we'll just put Vulkan SDK, and you'll see that this path here has evaluated to the correct place. And then we want to go to the additional dependencies, and we want to add libvulkan to our dependencies. So I just like to do that just to make sure I haven't made any spelling errors. Okay, uh, click OK and apply. Okay, make sure we build. Okay, cool. We've got no linking errors. Fantastic. But we have to still uh, set up the include paths because uh, our program doesn't know where to look for the headers. And that's going to be inside of C++ here, additional include directories. Once again, we go to edit, add a new value in here, and we can go with Vulkan SDK. Now, if I was to have a guess, it would be include with capital I. However, let's take a look. Oh my God, it is. I am incredible. Okay, and click OK, OK, run. Let's scan you no know, include errors. The other thing as well, when you're editing your properties, you want to make sure that you're editing all configurations and all platforms, or else maybe when you go to make a release build, you won't have the include path set up and it won't be able to find Vulkan. Anyway, not important. We'll go over to here and Vulkan, Vulkan.h. Um, and there's one more important thing. Um, if we go to document, you'll see that it actually has a bunch of different platform dependencies here. 
Um, we know in advance that we're using the Win32 platform. So we can just define that variable. And so now whenever um, this folder file gets included, um, this, where is it? This value is set. You can see that it's, it's now, the contents in here is nice and highlighted and we get the additional Win32 stuff for Vulkan, not just, um, ju you know, not just Vulkan Core, we're getting the Vulkan Window32 stuff and because we're on Windows, that's what we need. Okay, fantastic. Let's close those. Um, so going back to one I made earlier, you know, uh, Art Attack Blue Peter style, um, we've got uh, a windowing loop and then we've got the actual Vulkan stuff. This is the, the Vulkan commands that get done every frame in order to get the clear on the screen. And so the way Vulkan works is everything is split into what's called a command buffer. Rather than having a global state or giant state machines, you record commands into the individual command buffer. And this is the reason why Vulkan works as multi-threaded, is you can actually take a command buffer, record it on another frame, so doing all the iterating through all the models and iterating through all this stuff, and you have a full command buffer, and then you can copy it in as a secondary command buffer into your main command buffer. And that's where this sort of multi-threaded graphics API without having to worry about state machines comes from. It's through these command buffers. Okay. And so you reset the command buffer and start it new. You start a render pass, and that starting of a render pass clears the texture to this value here. Uh, and then we immediately just end the render pass, and then we end the command buffer. That's all we're doing. We're, all of this is just to clear that one texture from before. Then we submit the graphics command buffer, and then we present that frame uh, to the screen. Now, this is kind of really verbose, and there's actually some concepts that we're going to sort of introduce uh, first. So, if you've worked with other, sorry, you, you'll have to forgive me, I know this is shit. Um, but if you've worked with stuff like OpenGL, you'll have this concept of uh, swapping buffers. So, you're swapping between back buffer and a forward buffer. Um, so, you've got two. You've got one frame. You've got the one on screen that your user is currently looking at. You don't want to edit that while it's on screen because the user will note it. There's a chance that in between the monitor actually drawing the frame, you've updated it and the value changes. And that's where you get something called screen tearing from. Um, so what you do instead is you have two copies of the, uh, the texture that you're rendering to. You write to one while it's not being displayed to the user. Um, and then you keep one on screen and then you swap the two. Um, now this is, is great, right? It's um, one way of doing things. However, there's still some more places that we can find overhead. And instead in Vulkan, we have something called a swap chain and frames in flight. So a swap chain is a series of these frames, um, all in a group. You've got the one that's currently on screen, and then that'll be finished and go all the way back to the end. And then you've got this concept of frames in flight. So if you're, um, a frame in flight is, a frame that is currently being worked on. So the command buffer for that frame is being read, commands are being executed. And this is to help you sort of overcome driver overhead. Um, and I think most people tend to have like two frames in flight at once. Um, and so you have the one, the, the idea here is you have the finished frame being displayed to the user one that's 
finished and waiting to be displayed in between v-blanks and then the next one which you're starting to construct and in this case i've just added another one because the swap chain doesn't necessarily have to be a fixed size a lot of things will usually just use triple buffering i mean you can use whatever your device allows um, and so for each frame in flight it has to have its own command buffer if you think you imagine if you only had one command buffer and you were reading through this one command buffer and then suddenly you started writing to it while it's getting read your frame would get all messed up so you have another so for each frame in flight you have a copy of the command buffer and any resource that can change between frames will usually have to be copied for each frame in flight um that's the terminology that we use. So within Vulkan, you've got um, two types of synchronization objects. Both work on the concept of you wait on them until something else signals them when they're finished using it. Um, and this can be sort of um, a little bit confusing, but you've got something called a semaphore. Uh, which is a synchronization between things on the on the GPU exclusively. There's no communication back with uh, between the CPU and the GPU. However, you have a fence, and a fence object is a synchronization between the CPU and the GPU. Now that is um, slower, um, and you should really minimize the number of fences that you use. But it's actually quite confusing, sort of thinking about how all of these different things interact, what's weighted on, what's uh, signaling, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to take an example. Um, we're going to follow the lifetime of this frame, um, starting from the wait for fence. Um, so. If we look at what signals this fence, so we travel this backwards, um, because you can't assume that this is your first frame. It could be any frame, right? Um, and in the case that it is the first frame, what will happen is you just won't wait on these fences. Um, so we start our frame with wait on fence, and we look back and we think, ah, what signals this fence? And it's the submit graphics queue. Um, and the graphics queue finishes when the command buffer is finished being read. Um, why do we want to do this? It's because we don't want to write onto our command buffer while it's still being read. Otherwise, we run the risk of overwriting our command buffer like midway through a frame. Um, and this is the only sync that happens between the CPU and the GPU. Um, so once this happens, the uh, CPU is then free to go off and um, do its thing to record a new command buffer for the next frame. Um, and so this can take you know an amount of time. We don't know how long. Um, but usually in the case of what's happening is we'll get the, the frame that was finished previously is then now put onto the screen. So inside the command buffer, we want to place something that, um, waits for this, um, screen to be finished shown to the user. And this, once again, this doesn't perform any um, CPU weights. All this is saying is tell the command buffer to not write to this screen until it is no longer on the screen. Sorry, it tells the command buffer not to write to this frame until this frame is no longer being displayed to the user. Um, so, um, our command buffer is already full of commands. We've already recorded them on the CPU. And the first command is just saying, okay, I'm gonna wait. And at some point, this screen, uh, or this frame, sorry, finishes being shown to the user. And the next lot come around. 
Um, and so now this, we've changed command buffers, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but now this command buffer, uh, when that push like that happens, that then, as we can see um, from the presentation, signals the image is ready. So the image is ready to be written to now. So we can now actually start processing our GPU commands to finish up the rest of the frame and we'll iterate through the rest of the commands, the command buffer. Um, and once those commands are done, we then once again signal the fence and then we signal to the uh, that the image is ready to be shown on screen. Um, so, you know, we finished making our image, our image is ready. And this is a semaphore that the GPU will wait on before um, swapping out these frames. So say we're constructing our frame, constructing our frame, it goes long, it goes long, it goes long, and it's up to here, but it's not done yet. So this has to stay on the screen until that image done semaphore gets signaled. And that image done semaphore gets signaled by hitting the end of the command buffer. And that's how our things loop. It's a little bit difficult to keep track of, especially when you have multiple frames in flight, especially when you have multiple frames in flight, but it is kind of something that you get used to slowly but surely over time. So let's quickly take stock of the objects that we need to create um, for a frame. So obviously we need um, those, the, uh, those fences, we need those semaphores, we need a command buffer to write to. Um, we need a render pass, which is typically described of as a chunk of rendering work. It's quite an abstract concept, um, but as you can see here, what we're doing is we're, we're just saying like, oh, uh, clear the frame buffer, render to this offset, like this cutout. Um, you know, it's, it's a very abstract, thing uh, but the idea here is basically when it starts we clear the frame buffer and then when it ends we do something else um, either get it ready for the next render pass or we get it ready to be shown to the screen um, we end the command buffer and the command buffer sorry end the render pass and the command buffer um, and then we move on to the queue submit so that means we need a queue object as well. Um, and uh, we then do the present presentation. So that also needs another queue, a different queue, the present queue. Um, and then we sort of update our frame and flight index and then we go back to the beginning. Um, okay, so that's sort of like our end goal. It's <laughs> gonna be honest, it is still quite confusing. Um, but you know what? Let's uh, dive headfirst in, um, I think is probably the best way to go about this. So putting away our one we made earlier, uh, let's continue on with what we had earlier. Um, so once again, I'm just going to quickly make the application, uh, sorry, the header side by side. Um, the first thing that we probably need is another macro because Vulkan calls most of them return what's called a VK result. Uh, so uh, I like to use uh, return on VK. Yes, um, do uh, uh, and then how is again a VK result is equal to X. If res is not equal to the gate success, uh, print f, Vulcan call, uh, and, and then I guess we'll return res as well. And then just quickly, while zero, so you do that work, um, for nine, almost, almost, nearly, uh, just there, smash there, for some reason, uh, okay, nice, um, okay, cool, uh, so that's our terrible Vulcan macro. We've set up our include directories, uh, and we can check that once again just by going up here. Uh, we've set our platform correctly, and we have also um, set up our link directories correctly, and we know that because 
we can run this and we don't get a linking error. Um, so I guess the first thing to do is there's some stuff that we can set up with Vulkan um, before the window is shown. Not a lot, um, but there's still some. So turn on VK. No, sorry, return on fail because we're not making a VK call. Um, let's just say start Vulcan. Uh, okay, let's give this Vulcan thing a struct. So type dev struct Vulcan info. Info and hmm, let's see what the first thing we're going to need. We're going to need an instance. And the instance is kind of like the connection to the Vulkan library itself. It manages, because you can have multiple graphics cards installed at the same time with Vulkan, multiple implementations, the instance is the CPU side handle for managing those different things. Um, so it makes sense. The first thing we need to create is the instance. Um, and so this start Vulkan, will probably want to take a pointer to the Vulcan info VK VK um, int start up Vulcan take a Vulcan info pointer VK And then we're going to make a new file uh, specifically for the Vulcan stuff. So add new item Vulcan.c. Move that across. Application. So again, we want to just check return on null. VK because I don't trust myself to not be an idiot. And then we're going to introduce uh, probably one of the slightly more frustrating sides of Vulkan, and it's the fact of using create infos. Um, every create info has what's called an S type and a P next. Um, so you pass, if you need to chain Vulkan objects together, you use a linked list um, of P next chains. So uh, going over to Inkscape, uh, you'll have like different Vulcan objects. They'll kind of be each Vulcan create info has a PNX chain. And so you know that it points, it might point to something, it might not, and then points to the next one. And then the first member is always the S type field. And that tells you what sort of structure type you're dealing. And that's how they get away with having sort of uh, generic uh like uh generic uh linked lists um so vk instance create info uh and this is where i hope you like holding down shift vk structure type instance create info um and then p next is null because we're not attaching anything and then what other members do we have we have the flags member that is zero um as it is a reserved um and let's see and so this is where we start sort of um uh helping with the CPU. So layers are things that help you sort of intercept every Vulcan call. And then you have extensions, which obviously provide some sort of extension that isn't necessarily in the core API. Uh, but we're only setting up stuff on the instance side of things. So we're actually going to more or less ignore those for now. But there is one field here, uh, p application info. Um, this exists um, to allow drivers to identify different applications. So previously, um, what you end up finding is game engineers 
uh, when they're writing uh, a graphics renderer, they're not necessarily going to be able to optimize for every single individual platform, because that's fucking impossible um, and would be a Herculean task. So a lot of graphic drivers have specific optimized code paths for specific um, games. And that sort of takes a little bit of the burden off the developer, but adds some uh, burden on the graphics API, uh, sorry, the graphics vendor. But, you know, anyway. So we need a, uh, a P next. Uh, we also need to actually give the instance something. Um, but right now I know that that's going to fail because a lot of this is null when it shouldn't be null so let's just check our macro uh it doesn't you know our macro fails correctly i think is the way to think about it so we pass a pointer to our create info a lot of vulcan calls have this um allocation callbacks that's null uh not null pointer we're in c not c plus plus um, and then p instance so that's the instance we want to create which is in the k instance and we'll also quickly check the um turn on vk macro and okay ah <laughs> yes that would make sense include uh stdio dot h Oh, I'm stupid. I didn't stringify the macro. There we go. Oh, huh? <laughs> that should fail. <laughs> More rather, that's supposed to fail. Um. Okay, I guess not. If result is not equal to VK success. Um, what? Did we get an instance handle back? Uh, we could check. Huh, okay, we do. Interesting. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. It's not supposed to go that well. Uh, well, I'm ex expecting it to fail like on purpose. Um, uh, so what's a quick way we can get this to fail? Um, const char star uh, extension. We're going to feed it a fake extension. That should force a fail. Uh, fake. Um, it's up there. Dot pp <laughs> pp. Um, sorry, I am a child. Um, and dot enabled extension count is equal to one. And that should fail. Did it? Did it fail? Yeah. See? Okay, lovely. Our macro works. Okay, lovely. Fantastic news. Um, so let's, you know, not fail this um so i guess that means okay uh so we need to first of all let's address that application uh info field um there is a reason we need to do this um and it's to set the api version um you see that field there um s type is equal to vk your type uh, application info uh, API version we want to say uh, VK make API version and we're going to be targeting 0 0.1 sorry 1.0 um, so the variant is just if you're like uh, uh, if you're manufacturing a driver you could potentially have a uh, a variant of the API but in this case we don't we're just targeting the core uh, and what changes between API version is the instance extensions that are enabled by default um, 
I'm trying to think of a way to describe that. Um, I believe in Vulkan 1.3, the dynamic rendering extension was added into core. So if you were to say do this, you would then not have to enable the dynamic rendering if you wanted to use dynamic rendering. But we're not. We're just keeping things plain, simple, stupid. Um, so we're going to target API version 1. Um, is there any other field that needs filling in here? I don't think so. I think that's all good. Um, you notice there was an engine field there. So for example, if you were, um, if you made a Unity game and it had a Vulkan backend, that would probably pass, you know, Unity build so-and-so um, as the engine name. And that just helps your graphics developers put in special secret paths into their drivers. And that's why when you go to update your NVIDIA drivers, they're fucking massive. So if you want to blame someone, um, no, don't blame anyone. It's nobody's fault. Um, okay. And so there's actually a little bit more that we need to create for the instance. For example, we are actually going to need some instance extensions which aren't in core. Um, for example, because we um, because we're using Win32, Windows isn't core to the Vulkan API, so we need to actually add in the Windows extension. If that makes sense, I think that makes sense. Um, so const char. I always forget how uh, star and then okay, cool. Extensions is equal to so we need Vulkan win. Nope, they define. They do define the name for this somewhere. Um, go to the document. Wins, uh, yeah, okay. So the extensions are enabled on like kind of this weird, um, like they're, they're all given like a unique name and they all follow this form factor. Uh, the next thing we're going to enable is validation layers. So, uh, and of course, validation messengers. Um, we're going to do that because that's going to help us spot API errors rather than sort of umming and ahhing and guessing like, hmm, oh, what's this? Why is this happening? Okay. Um, so VKKHR debug. No. Utils? What's the name of this? Oh wait, no, it's not in KHR, it's EXT because it's an extension, I think. Debug. Utils extension name. Nice. Um, and so we're going to attach that. Um, got enabled. Extension count is equal to the size of that extension divided by the size of a character pointer. So we're basically saying, no, there we go. Uh, so basically, that's just saying, like, oh, how many elements are in that? And we can use size of um, because this is a you know compile time known very uh, array, it's not a uh, it's not a devolved pointer. It's not like a pointer that we've passed in as a parameter. Otherwise, that would just be one. Um, anyway, so there are other things as well. So if you're using validation layers, uh, we also need um, const char star layers. And we are, this doesn't need to be, does it? Need to be doubled. No, it shouldn't be, I don't think. Yeah, no, it shouldn't be because it's already, anyway, sorry. Um, layers, so rather frustratingly, the layers don't have <laughs> their own names like as defined. So Vulcan 
uh, validation let's name uh, buh, 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 buh. validation layers. Oh look, Vulcan tutorial. This lovely thing. Yep, so this is, here we go, that's the name of the validation layers. And this is probably going to be your Bible whenever you study Vulcan. Um, but maybe it's nice to have like a little video follow on or uh, get something on screen before having to go through all the triangle stuff. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's make sure we enable that layer as well. So dot enabled layer pp enable names is equal to pointer to layers because we're um, yes. Yeah, so the difference is obviously this is an array of strings and this is just a string itself. So we need to take a pointer to the string, but not a pointer to the array of strings. Um, so that's why. This one has a reference, this one doesn't. Um, anyway, that should now work. Ha! Huh? See, look, look, we're getting validation errors because of our um, lovely warning. Like the by enabling validation layers, we're actually getting something that's telling us what's going wrong, and. We can read this quite easily. We're saying uh, missing extension required by the instance extension VK KHR Win32 surface. It's missing the Kronos surface. And obviously that makes a lot of sense because if you have a Kronos, uh, Vulcan also actually part of the core isn't, is um, like surfaces in general, like presenting isn't actually part of the core API. You can just have Vulcan on like something without a screen and it can do just compute work. Uh, so you don't, they don't force surfaces into the API. Um, so that means once again, we need to KHR, um, surface extension name. And now this time, if I rerun, we shouldn't get a one. Yeah. See, nice. That's why we enable validation layers. Um, thing to keep in mind here though is if you were to run this in release mode you would hit you will hit an error because validation layers aren't enabled in release so yeah see look there we go start of vulcan failed um and it's failed because we're trying to enable validation layers so a lot of places have this if not defined debug mode yada 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 the other thing as well is if you don't have the vulcan sdk installed you also don't have the validation layers installed and so if you're in debug mode and you're still hitting this um this error here it is most likely because you don't have um validation layers installed and you've potentially not installed the vulcan sdk properly anyway um that message was kind of maybe a bit on the verbose side um kind of you know, maybe we don't want every single warning to come through. And instead we want to actually control what comes through. Uh, and we can instead do that with a handy dandy BK debug utils. Debug utils messenger extension. Um, Okay, cool. And so once again, as with all things Vulcan, we need a VK debug utils messenger create info ext is equal to dot s type. Oh yeah, I hope you've got a strong pinky finger. Okay, so message severity, we only want errors, so VK uh, debug. So this takes um, a mask, or, and we only want to uh, let uh, messages which have the error severity set. Uh, dot message type, VK debug utils message 
type. Uh, we only want things that come from the actual validation layers uh, rather than, say, best practices or performances because we don't care about those at the minute. Um, there's no user data, uh, PNX, there's no PNX chain either, no flags. Um, however, once again, in the same way the Win32 API has to pass a function pointer, we also want to pass a function pointer. Um, and this is once again one of those things that I go to Vulkan Tutorial for because I can never ever in my life remember the function signature for this. Um, but it is that. And oh boy, that's a lot. But we only care about printf vk error. Probably good to make this quite obvious because you've had like a, uh, a you know, for the errors going on, you want to notice that, right? So let's set that up and um, let's give it a lot of new lines as well. There we go. Nice. Um, message, it's in, where is it? P callback data dot message. Nice. But one thing, uh, 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 need to give that struct a name. Um, debug callback. Sorry, I just I, I need to have. There we go. <laughs> Even if it's copied and pasted, I still need it to have um, nice formatting. Anyway. Now, here's where you're going to notice something kind of interesting. If, you, uh, if we actually try and go ahead and create that debug utils messing, uh, no, sorry, vk create debug utils messenger, and we use our instance that we have, and we use our uh, messenger info. We don't have uh, an allocator. Do have and obviously of course we need to return on VK. We're gonna notice something interesting that goes wrong. So even though we've actually got this in the header, this exists in the Vulcan header, we're gonna get a linking error. Um, see, look, unresolved external symbol, VK create debug utils messenger ext. Um, despite the fact it's in our header. And once again, this is because it's kind of like something on the uh, fringes of the API. It's kind of not fringes, but it's not always defined. So instead you have to do this weird thing. It's uh, function pointers. So you, you have to actually fetch the function pointer uh, from the Vulkan API. Uh, and that's kind of a pain, um, <laughs> but you can do it with this uh, VK get proc address, instance get proc address, because this is an instance level function. We can tell it's an instance level function because the first parameter is an instance. Um, anyway, so we need to get an instance. <laughs> oh yeah. So the reason why you need to get the instance proc address is because if your instance hasn't enabled this layer and this extension, then this function pointer, like this, this function pointer in the header won't be defined. So that's why it's kind of left unresolved and you have to kind of find it yourself. It's still a little bit annoying, um, but hey ho. Uh, and then we can null pointer check it. So turn on. No. Great. Fantastic. Um, and then we can use this function pointer to create it instead. Nice. Lovely. And we can check that our messenger is working. Um, first things first, we need to actually make sure we return zero because it's got a nice value. Lovely. Um, 
so in the cleanup part of Vulcan, you know, once you've allocated everything, it's a good idea probably uh, to clean up everything you've allocated. So clean up Vulcan. Let's again take a info star UK and we'll yoink. Put it in here. First thing we're going to do is destroy that instance we made. So VK destroy instance, not instance. <laughs> of course, we also need to Uh, that needs to be an int type, not a void type. Uh, turn zero, of course, and this is missing something. Ah, the allocator. Once again, we don't use an allocator. And if we then go and close this, one thing that you need to keep in mind with Vulcan is you need to destroy things in order. We created a device uh, messenger, but we haven't destroyed it yet. So when we destroy the instance, we'll get a, we'll get an error. We should get an error, and the, <laughs> the reason we're not hitting that is because we haven't we haven't put the clean up in here yet, have we? No. So clean up Vulcan. Ek. And now, there we go, see, look, and we can tell it's our uh, thing getting hit because it's got all of these obnoxious new lines. Um, and of course, once again, we can hit the breakpoint. We can put a breakpoint in here as well, and we can, oh, look okay. it. And because I have actually built the validation layers, um, I have the symbols for them, I think. And you can see the validation layers in the call stack, which is quite cool. All right, that's quite a cool thing um, if you're into that. Um, so let's make sure that we actually destroy that instance. So just as we created it and we had to get a function pointer for creating it, we have to do the same thing for destroying it. VK. And I think this is the only thing that we need to fetch the function pointers for. Um, if I remember correctly. Yes, because it's the only thing that uses layers. Uh, but, um, feels kind of counter like pointless to return on null if this fails, because we're in the cleanup anyway, and it will get cleaned up by um, <sighs> by the application, like by the operating system anyway, but you know, still it's good practice and all that. Uh, so we need the instance, uh, we need the messenger that we're destroying. And once again, the allocator was allocated with, we're not using an allocator and this time no, no errors. Fantastic. Um, so now we're going to, after this, move on to the physical device stuff. So if you'll um, <laughs> ignore my fantastic art skills, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of sort of where the instance and uh, sort of physical device and then logical device come in. So over here, you have your physical devices. And as the name might suggest, that represents an actual physical GPU in your computer or maybe uh, an implementation. So there's something called Swift Shader, uh, which is a CPU implementation of Vulkan. So it's some kind of implementation of Vulkan on your computer. Um, for example, if you have uh, an integrated graphics card in your CPU, and then a discrete GPU, you might find that you have two separate physical devices. Um, and then over here, you have the logical devices. And logical devices are sort of um, 
a reference um, of of like pointing to that physical device as a way to communicate with that specific physical device, and you can enable uh, different device extensions for different um, extensions, and it is uh, sorry for different logical devices, and it's a way of basically the physical device implementation tracking different use cases across different and over here we have the instances across sort of like different applications and different instances and so you can have multiple instances in one Vulkan application or you could have multiple applications each one with one instance uh, so it's all this big chain but what we care about right now is we have our application we have one instance and we want to check how many physical devices there are and then we want to create one of these logical devices for us to send commands to. Um, this is probably the least clear drawing I've ever made in my entire life but hopefully that might help you sort of understand where we're going here. Um, so let's head on back over to the code um, and we're going to uh, start the device. So int uh, startup uh, device. And it's again Vulcan info pointer VK and yoink and yoink. Um, turn on null. And I kind of ask myself, like, what's the point in doing these return on nulls if I know that I'm not going to pass a null? But also, I never under—I should never underestimate my own stupidity, um, because I am quite <laughs> like I can probably see myself hand handing here like a null pointer or something stupid like that at some point. Um, start. Up, uh, device, uh, VK, and we're putting that after the window has come on screen. Um, anyway, there is a reason for that at some point, but we'll we'll get onto that perhaps in a little bit. Um, obviously, turn zero. I Ah, so there is um so how do we query the physical devices right we don't actually know how many physical devices there are uh, so there's something called enumerate uh, physical devices and we use our instance in order to do that um uh, and the the point in which uh, so the way these like enumerates work is you first count how many devices um, and that is passed to you via this pointer here and then after you know how many physical devices there are you can then allocate space for that number of physical devices and then pass it the, and then call this command again, but this time actually passing some memory to receive those physical devices. Um, and so if physical device count is zero, you don't have a Vulcan compatible physical device. So print F no uh, Vulcan GPU installed. Sad face. And give us an Xcode minus uh, five for some reason. Um, but one thing that you can do, which um, it's kind of a bit hacky because you might have more than one physical device. I, for a fact, know that I only have one. So I can just skip past this and go physical device count equals one and BK. Devices, BK, 
instance and physical device count and physical devices. I need a place to store that. So probably in here would be a good idea. Physical device, physical. And so the way the spec is defined is um, only when the pointer to the physical device array that the user has passed, so this one, only if this is null will Vulkan then actually go away and count the physical devices and then edit this value. Um, if this is a non-null pointer, then Vulcan will find the number of physical devices indicated by this value. Um, so I can just go like that, because I know for a fact I have a Vulcan enabled physical device. You shouldn't ever do this in like anything like, uh, like any kind of production or anything like that, but, you know, um, oh well. And we should probably check this result as well. Does it? Yep, it gives us a VK result. So turn on VK. Cool. And let's, I don't know, ask something about the physical device. So VK, uh, yeah, physical device properties. Um, we're going to ask. So we need a piece of memory to store those property, a piece of memory to store those properties. So VK physical device properties props. And printf Vulcan device is and percent S new line props dot um, device name. There we go. Ah, uh, look at that. Hey. Yeah, sorry. I hate to flex on you, but I do have a 3060 Ti. Um, <laughs> I'm now aware that this is actually not new and not exciting to have anymore but it was at the time. I got it for retail price as well. I, I had the Discord ping set up and everything. Um, anyway, so that's not, not really important, is it? Um, so we don't actually care about those. So, um, sorry, we're down here. We don't actually care about those properties. If that's just to like show us that we can actually fetch information, from the physical device, but we don't actually want the physical device. We want the logical device. So in Vulcan, that is called just a regular device. Um, I suppose the lack of specifying that it's physical implies logical, I guess. Uh, anyway, VK device, create info, uh, device is equal to, once again, S type Nope, we're not quite there yet. Device there we go. What else have we got in here? Okay, so there used to be this split between uh device layers and instance layers. That is no longer a thing anymore. Um, so we don't, we don't use that anymore. We just, um, we, we leave those as null in current implementations, uh, enable features. Um, that could be any extra features you want to enable. I believe like ray tracing and acceleration structures will need this. Um, but we go down to this enabled extensions names and we do actually need to enable an extension. Uh, so const char extension is equal to, what is it again? VK swap chain extension name. There we go, yes. Uh, so if you remember from one of these diagrams at some point, the other one, swap chain, we need 
uh, as you can imagine, because we've got this GPU up here, it is a GPU extension. Uh, so it's part of the actual uh, device. So PP uh, with extension names is equal to uh, extension. There is only one. And I think we might actually be able to make a logical device off that. Let's see. VK create device uses it takes a physical device so vk physical and once again we use no callbacks and we store this in, over in here and of course we should oh shit Press Control Home instead of Home. I'm still trying to get better at like doing the fancy keyboard stuff, but as you can probably tell, I'm not very good at it. Uh, so return on VK, and let's check. Ah, oh, we're hitting an error. Nice. What error are we hitting? Um. Ah, yeah. Create Q info count must be greater than zero. Obviously, that makes sense. We need queues to submit to. Uh, so, going back to here, we need a submit queue and a presentation queue. And there's a large pain in the ass about finding the valid queues. And um, the queues are stored in what's called queue families. Um, and it's a real... So, you basically have um, a bunch of queues given by index, so there's Q family 0, Q family 1, Q family 2, or however many. And each one of those Q families will support different queues. And almost always, not necessarily always, but almost always Q family 0 supports presentation and graphics. And we're going to just sort of hope that's the case for you. If not, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll cover that in a later section. But the important thing to think about is um, why would you want different queues? Um, and the answer is there's, some, there's something called a transfer queue. Um, so maybe you want to be able to upload things to your physical device or just to your GPU. You want to change in a texture, change in a model. You want to upload some data to your GPU, but you don't want to store the graphics commands. You don't want, you know, you don't want to suddenly stop uploading data. Uh, sorry, you don't want to suddenly stop rendering just because you have to change a model. You want to change, upload the model, and when when that upload's finished, then start using it. And so, if you have a separate queue, perhaps a queue that only supports uploading, then you can use those two things simultaneously. Um, but in this case, we are mainly interested in a graphics queue and a presentation queue, and we're going to hope and assume that it's in queue family zero. So VK queue create info, VK device create info, lovely. Um, what members does this have? Of course, VK device queue VK structure type device queue create info always fit in the structure type uh, queue priorities mm -hmm. for some reason this needs to be a float pointer I um, I actually haven't found a use case for this priority. I suppose if you were uploading, you would want your uploads to have a lower priority than your graphics, probably. Uh, why it's a pointer, I don't know, but oh well. Um, what other members do we have here? Where's my IntelliSense gone? There's my IntelliSense. Flags, don't care about. Q count, uh, don't care about, just put one, I guess. 
uh, Q family index uh, is once again we're assuming it's going to be zero. Um, I haven't encountered a device yet where Q0 doesn't support graphics and presentation, but I assume potentially one does exist out there. Uh, so then we're going to attach that to our device create info. Um, and of course, we need to tell the device how many queues we're creating. In this case, it's one. Let's try now. Nice. No errors. Lovely. But we do get a new error. And that's because our uh, device hasn't been destroyed. So we need to destroy the device. And of course, this isn't like breaking. This doesn't destroy, you know, you're not going to get a, um, some kind of, like, you're not going to get a crash if you don't do this, but it's, it's you know, good practice. Although, actually, if you're using a, a, an allocation callback, you might get a crash. I don't know. Um, either way, destroy our device. Fantastic. Right. That's, that's lovely. So we now have a device and we can start using what's called device level functions. And that's functions where the first parameter is, an, is a device instead of an instance. So the command buffer belongs to the device. Um, the frame buffer, the render pass, the swap chain images, all of those belong to the device. And so you need a device handle before you can start uh, creating them and using them and targeting them. Um, so speaking of that, maybe we should now create the swap chain. And this is, oh mighty me, an endeavor and a half. <laughs> um, but it does need doing, unfortunately. Um, so swap chain. Um, so we, so this is why we create the device at this stage, because we need the, um, we need the window on screen to be able to create the swap chain. Um, so yeah. And bum, bum, bum. Nearly worked. It was nearly perfect. Um, so <laughs> back into the Vulcan. Uh, collapse that. Collapse that. Okay. So then. Oh, start up swap chain. No. <laughs> oh yeah. There's no content here. Of course. See, I told you, I'm an idiot, and that's why we have these. Okay, so, okay. so there's a, um, a CPU object which corresponds to this thing on screen here, right? So the, the swap chain is actually the series of images that are coming from, um, from the device, you know, so this is the swap chain, but this thing here, the container that presents the device, uh, like the image, and is composited, is part of the surface. And that's handled by the operating system, which is handled by the CPU, which means it uses the instance. Uh, so we need to create an instance level structure called the surface. Um, so. We need to create a Win32, so specifically, we're going to be creating a Win32 surface as well. Um, because we're on Windows and the different surfaces take different, uh, you know, the different operating systems have different types of surfaces and they'll need different parameters to identify them. So, VK structure type. Uh, Win 
32 surface create info KHR. And look at that. We actually need our H instance and our window handle. Um, so that means instead of just the Vulkan info, we're also going to need a pointer to our application. Uh, so put that in there, put that in here, the ampersand is win. Okay, so start up swap chain, we need to return on null once again. Turn on null uh, app. Is in fact a member. Uh, going to close this so this can all rejig its flow. Ah, extra bracket, that's why. Okay, is that. What's the build error? Startup swap chain, redefinition, different. Ah, once again, extra bracket. Cool, based. Um, anyway, sorry about that. So once again, uh, we need to handle the instance. So instance and and so what's actually quite interesting specifically on windows is if you remember earlier when we created this we asked was this a uh, did this window handle have a parent and so if you make a parent window you can actually segment your your screen into different slices and so you can render directly to these different slices on your window um, but we're not going to be doing that right now um, is there anything else nope what does this take this takes the instance uh, it takes our surface create info callback which again we don't use and it also takes pointer to a surface surface KHR surface and we'll also just want to Yay! And if I close it, we get an error about the surface not being destroyed correctly. Uh, so, let's do that properly, shall we? Um, bum, 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 ba -da -bum. Um, yeah, okay. And at some point, I'm probably going to stop caring about ensuring that everything gets deleted properly, if I'm honest. Um, but it's probably good checking if the um, if the object has been created properly, because if it's been if it throws an error for just <clears throat> sorry about that, um, if it throws an error. Uh, because it hasn't been destroyed properly, it means it's been created properly. Um, anyway, so now from this surface, we're going to want to create the swap chain. Not sure if you saw, just how many members this has. Come on, am I right? Is this a thing? Does this have a value? No. God damn. 
VK struck type. I feel like I was close. I'm not actually sure if I was close or not. Um, but in case you were curious, let's go to the definition. <laughs> and this is how many. Um, yeah, it's quite a few. Um, but a lot of them we don't actually have to, you know, care about. Um, and we'll we'll fill those in. I want to think fairly quickly. And if not, the validation errors will help us. So first things first, surface. So the surface is just that surface we just made. Uh, what else? Um, um, Q family index count is one. P Q family indices, that takes points to a unit 32. So you in 32 dash T uh, present family index. And once again, we're assuming that's going to be zero for our sanity's sake. Um, I should, I'm going to just swap the order of those two, just because my theme has been pointed to the thing, then followed by the count. Image sharing mode, so because the graphics queue and the present queue hopefully have the same family index, it means that they're not being shared. So we can do VK sharing mode concurrent. No, VK. <laughs> this is actually the exact opposite, exclusive. So we're not sharing. So the image that getting presented to the screen, we're not sharing that between the graphics queue and the um, presentation queue. Otherwise, occasionally you would have to like um, swap. Like you have to change ownership, so uh, like a queue owns an object. And if anyway, not important. Um, Pre-transform, ek transform peak definition. Let me just see what these are. So this is a flag, and it is one of those. Uh, okay, so I guess this is like what transformation is applied to the surface when you're taking the image and rotate 270 degrees. It's a bit weird, but um, no, we're not doing any of that. We're not doing any weird rotations. We're just keeping the identity. Um, so we'll keep the identity transform uh, clipped. VK true, I guess. So it is getting clipped. Composite alpha, BK. It's cap locks. Oh my god, caps locks is on. Composite alpha. And so this is like, uh, if you're actually, I'm not entirely sure what this is for. I think it's if you say wanted, um, if you had like something behind, you, you know, when you get like sort of blurred things, you get like, you can sort of see through a window. Maybe that's it, but we're just going to leave things opaque. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, image array layers. Okay, so I think that's all of like the pretty obvious stuff out of the way. Um, so image array layers is one. I actually don't know why. Um, it's just I've always seen it as one. That's probably something I should look into. Um, so the next things we need are the image. Ah, image usage. That's yeah. Uh, that's another one we can bang out. Um, so what is the image being used for? Uh, VK image usage color attachment bit, right? There's there's a bunch of different things that you can use an image for. Um, so uh, you can use it as a depth stencil attachment, but we're using it as a color attachment bit because we're, we're rendering to a color target. So color attachment bit, uh, that's just um, 
you know, we're rendering to a color target, so color target attachment bit. Uh, let's get rid of that. Give ourselves some nice formatting. Um, and so I believe the remaining members are going to be image extent. So that is the size of the image on the screen, the image format. And I then I think that's I think that's it. Okay, so how do we get those? Because, you know, where are they coming from? Right? Uh, how do we know that, like, maybe this is sRGB? What color space is it? Who knows? Um, so we can actually get that from the physical device by handing it a surface. So device uh, VK. There we go. VK get physical device surface formats. Um, so we need to add in the physical device, the surface, and I think unfortunately on this one, I'm not 100% sure if you can do that trick from earlier. I don't think you can with this one. I think it does actually throw an error. So we're going to do this properly this time. Um, so uint 32 t format count is equal to zero format count null putter okay and vk what what type is this is this just a vk format no it's vk surface format good thing i checked vk surface format KHR formats is equal to malloc um, size of uh, format count times by size of uh, VK surface format KHR. So we're making a dynamic memory request. Oh, fucking hell. We're in a C file, come on. This should automatically typecast. Oh, I'm stupid. <laughs> Fuck's sake. So in CPP, um, you need to manually cast the output of malloc and that's something that really annoys me. Um, anyway, so once again, uh, we're gonna call this, but this time we're gonna hand in arrays of formats. And also, we need to free our dynamic memory allocation. Let's not forget about that. Um, and also, this can be null, so return on null. Uh, it's unlikely, but you never know. Um, okay, cool. And um, we should also probably VK check these as well. I think. Do these return? Yes, they do return a VK result. Okay, cool, nice. And so there's like this whole rigmarole of choosing like the best format that you want to display and each format having different properties. But I actually don't care. So <laughs> we're going to go formats, take the first option, and because it's a surface format, not just a format, it has two members in it. So image, image color space. And there's one final thing we need, and that is the extent. So that is the size. Now, something that's actually going to be quite interesting. So if I go extent, uh, where is it? image extent dot width and I set that to be the applications width and height we're going to get an error and I'm curious if you will be able to tell me why in advance um but let's see where's my error oh I'm not calling startup swap chain Wait, no, I should be. No, I'm 
Okay, I'm not trying to create the swap chain. There we go. So this is our first device created thing. And null. VK. I don't have a swap chain yet. Ah, there's another member that I have forgotten as well. And that is the number of images in the swap chain. If we go back to here, you will see that there is a number of images in the swap chain. And usually you would have to bound that, so bound check it, um, between the number of actually supported. Um, most people go with triple buffering, and of course, most places do support triple buffering. Um, dot min image count. So we're just going to go with three. I believe in... On my desktop, the maximum supported is eight, which I don't know who's octopal buffering, but someone might be. Um, and I feel like that probably um, summarizes like Vulcan. You know, someone might be. Um, and look, we get a bunch of errors. Fantastic. That's exactly what we want to see. Uh, that formatting is wrong because it doesn't end with a comma. Put it back. Lovely. Um, okay, so VK surface current extent. Ah, our current extent is too large. And you might have noticed on Windows, the title bar counts towards the size of your window. So, uh, and these little bits on the side as well. These actually count, so we need to bound the size of our extent between those. Um, so that means we need to get the current bounds of the uh, surface. So VK get physical VK get physical device surface capabilities maybe. I wonder which one it is. Um, let's look at the members instead. VK um, surface capabilities KHR cap. Show me what you are. Wait. Peak definition, extent. Okay, lovely, cool. Um, so now we'll go and get those. So VK get physical device surface capabilities. VK device, VK surface, and pointer to the capabilities. And it does give a, a result, so return Okay, um, and one thing I noticed here is that the capabilities actually list um, the current extent So I think I might just use the current extent and see if that works I remember when I was messing around with Vulkan, the current, ex uh, sorry, Wayland on my Linux machine, machine, the current extent member when I did this was uh, 4,000 times by 2,000 on my laptop, which has a 1080p screen. Um, so I think maybe the current extent is potentially not 100% reliable, but I don't know. Uh, at least, I think on Windows it probably should be.
literally paralyze as soon as my precious intelligence gets taken away. No. Hello. Unhandled exception. Ooh. What's happened? What have I gotten wrong? What have I been a goober about? VK surface capabilities, KHR, VK physical device. Ah, I'm passing on the <laughs> logical device instead of the physical device. More validation errors. Okay, interesting. Ah. Nah. So, this one was uh, something that I came across, which was kind of annoying, and there wasn't really any good um, spotting for this. So, this implied image creation, uh, basically the swap chain that you create, it has, you fetch the images from that swap chain, so there's like an implied uh parameters that it's getting from your swap chain um and there's this whole thing about get physical device image formats um and but there's no vk image tiling optimal there's no like tiling member right i don't know i was like oh where is this coming from and it turns out actually um so we need to use the vulcan configurator from before uh in the tools um and we need to edit and we need to force off the obs uh hook layers i think oh wait maybe not obs hooks okay so my obs hooks are forced off oh wait no the Vulcan configurator doesn't start turning off these layers until it's on. So what I meant to say is, okay, I have now forcibly enabled. What you might find is and originally is these are all implicitly on. What that means is, is they're automatically loaded by Vulcan. You don't get to select, uh, like the Vulcan application doesn't get to select to load that layer. And that's, I think this is probably not a good idea on OBS's part. I feel like it should be up to the application to choose which layers it is, especially if the layer is doing something as massive as capturing directly from the swap chain. And, you know, it, I, I get where they're coming from. The idea that I saw was like, you want it to be able to just work with any Vulkan application. And so if you make this implicit, it will get implicitly loaded. The only problem is um, that they uh, currently, it fucks with the surface creation. So I, I believe it's currently doing something out of spec, or at least out of spec of 1.13. Uh, let me try that again. VK create instance has failed. Interesting. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um. Ah, right, of course. I was developing a layer myself. Um, and of course, um, it's not very good. So I also need to ensure that that's off as well. And look, there we go. So... Um, I should probably just clarify that that's not uh, that's not just like it's not my layer that's causing this. So my layer was screwing with the um, instance creation, right? My layer uh, isn't, however, um, screwing around with the OBS like the surface creation. So we'll just enable one of those. Oh, hang on, maybe it was me. Uh oh. Uh, implicitly on, uh, implicitly on, yeah, there we go, uh, so it is in fact OBS, 
one of these OBS hook LEDs. I believe there is currently an open ticket for it. Um, either way, it's kind of a bit annoying, but you know, anyway. So that's why we want the Vulcan configurator. Anyway, that's all out of the way. Let's try closing that. The next thing that we need to do is we need to extract the images out of the swap chain. And the other thing I think we should probably do is we should probably store the format uh, just in case. Format. Just in case something else references it in the future. And also the extent as well. I'm not 100% sure if something else does reference either of these things, but something might. And, you know, just in case, we probably should store those. Uh, so we can swap extent equal to... Uh, we'll just use this one out. Oh, we got there eventually. <laughs> there we go. Okay, right then. So, now we need to get the actual raw images out of this. Um, so, there's going to be a couple of them. So, VK, swap chat. Uh, Like all things, swap images, swap images, um, and so that can be done with a. You know, we need to make enough space for the swap chain images. So, malloc um, and. We need to actually ask the, the, the swap chain how many swap chain images it created. So VK There's a thing about swap chain image count somewhere, I'm sure of it. Uh BK create swap chain. Oh, it's the same as the enumeration. Okay, uh, VK get swap chain images. AHR VK gets images KHR uh, stands for Kronos. In case you were curious, you went thirty two dash t swap images. So device function, so it starts with the device, swap chain, uh, swap images, null, um, and we should also do a return on VK as well, because these things can fail, uh, and we need to allocate enough memory for the image handles. So swap chain images times by size of uh, VK image. Not <sighs> size of VK image. There we go. Return, return on null. VK swap images. And then once again, but except this time we pass in the actual handle to VK swap images. Let's try that again. Nice. Hmm. Something doesn't feel right. I don't know why the device validation layers aren't uh, aren't firing. They should, but they're not. And I don't quite know why. 
Um, but these are raw images, so these will usually refer to something like the actual raw bytes, and that's not actually what we want. Well, we do want that, but we want to get the metadata. But of course, the GPU doesn't store the metadata directly next to the image, so instead we have something called an image of view. Um, and that's something that sort of stores... Um, you know, the format, uh, the size of the image, how many layers it has, the MIPS it layers, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so once again, going to have to malloc those. So uh, not swap images, I like to call them swap views. So VK swap views to malloc. Uh, and of course, if you were doing this in C++, you could probably get away with just using, uh, well, not get away. You can just use vectors, basically, <laughs> and resize them instead of worrying about all this. And then um, the C++ uh, exception and the C++ runtime will handle all of this for you. Um, but I prefer C, um, just because... I do, for some reason. I don't really know why. That's just how uh, I turned out. <laughs> um, VK image view. Cool. Uh, the real reason I don't like C++ is because um, it's a nightmare hellscape. Um, uh, there's been a lot of stuff on like the standard committees recently, like uh, trying to. I saw one post about how the fact uh, if you get like I think it was a file extension, like the dot txt of a full file path in std file path, that creates a new file path. Um, the other thing I also don't like about the standard library in C++, uh, for specifically in string parsing. Um, and also in vectors as well, is you're not in charge of the memory allocation. So if you concatenate two strings, for example, the C++ runtime goes away and does, um, like, the creates enough memory for a string that holds all of the concatenation and then deletes the other two members. It's... <laughs> anyway, not important. They're completely off topic. Uh... So we now need the image view create info. Uh, so use s type is equal to vk structure type image new create info and see. Let's see what other um, components we have. So Components is an interesting field. Um, the idea here is um, if you... Uh, so components are the parts that make up the different channels of the image, so R, G, B, A, for example. Um, and you have to specify something called a swizzle. Uh, the idea here being if you handle... If you hand a four-part component flow to something that, say, has three components, how do you swizzle those components together, if that makes sense. This doesn't make sense at all. Um, if you have one 32-bit float and your target is a 32-bit uh, image, but each float only uses four bytes, um, sorry, four bits, because it's uh, what, four, four bits? Yeah, anyway, anyway. Um, the idea being if you have, uh, let's go to Inkscape, fuck it. Um, you, where's the pen? You have um, an image. Like, fantastic, fantastic image, great, love it. Not 100 width, that's not very useful. If you have your image and inside each component you have, you know, so each pixel, you then have um, 
an R G B A um, value, right? And you try and write a free part component. So maybe you try, maybe you don't care about the alpha channel, and you're only emitting not dot one or not 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 right. And you're trying to fit that into a four component variable or maybe even you have one variable that's using all 32 bits and you're just having like a how does that then get spread apart between the different individual components and and that's called swizzling uh, i'm gonna be honest i'm not actually 100 percent sure i that explanation uh, came from my ass uh, and I could be entirely wrong. And if I am wrong, I would please like corrections. Um, so anyway, so we go into the components.a and we want that to be VK components swizzle identity. Uh, we're basically saying don't do anything with the swizzle. Um, so you can set it up so the rights to the R channel go to the G channel all sorts of shit uh we don't care just keep them keep them simple keep them simple stupid as i say uh dot components it's wondering where my intellisense went for a second i am hopeless without my my intellisense uh r dot g uh, dot components RGB. It's because I started with A. A should go last. And in fact, I am in fact going to make A go last. It's RGBA, not ARGB. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, structure definitions in C. The members don't have to be in order. The compiler will figure that out for us. But still. Um, so. The format, we know the format because it's from the uh, swap chain format. Fantastic. Uh, we know the... Does it ask for the extent? It doesn't ask for the extent. Nice. Okay. Uh, view type. So what kind of image are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at a 2D image. Uh, VK image view type. So you can have a 1D image, an array of 1D images, you know, all these things. So maybe you have a cube map, maybe you have a 3D image, but we don't have those. We have a 2D image, nice and simple. Um, what else is in here? Format, image, resource range. This is the other large field, I believe. Uh, so what is the aspect mask again? Peak definition. Go to definition. Ah, right. And I believe, yeah, so because we're using it as a color attachment bit, I believe we only need to specify that. Um, but that's probably something worth double checking uh, rather than finding out later. Uh, so Aspect mask is equals to image. Okay. I don't actually know what the difference between those two was. So, what? They are different. Okay. Wild. I guess I guess because it's. Oh wait, no, it is a different member. Uh, so the aspect mask is whether you're using like a. Uh, a depth attachment or a color attachment or something like that not what yeah um anyway sidetracked it's a color target right where it's a colored image uh what else is in the sub resource range um base mitmap level we don't have you know we don't even have any mitmaps in here so sub resource range uh map uh, MIP count. Give me the MIP count. Um, no. Uh, level count. This one level. I really wish that like specified. You know, the uh, level 
you know, mid level rather than just having the level count. It annoys me. Anyway, not important array there is equal to zero because we're only using the first one because we're only using the first um, array in like a la layer, you know, it's kind of like a pointer versus an array. We're only using one image, so only using the zeroth index. Um, anyway, layer count, let's get one. And the next thing is we need to give it the actual image handle. And unfortunately we need to do that per image. So we need to do that in a loop. Uh, VK Why not store the swap count in here? I should do We'll need that later Swap uh, Swap count How many values are in the swap chain? Um, where do I nab that? I nab it here so, VK swap count is equal to, yeah, there we go. That's probably a good idea. Uh, so now we can use swap count member there. And then for each one of these, we need to set the view dot image is equal to uh, VK swap images and it's not a pointer it's um, the actual handle itself so we use the array um, and dereference it there um, and then turn one vk vk create image view k device views null putter and because it takes a point to the image view um, there's two ways of doing it there's because the views are an array you can do that or you can do that which is my preference um, and let's see if we filled out everything correctly Nice. Fantastic. Ah, finally. <laughs> We're finally getting our errors from destroying things. Um, yeah, see, image view has not been destroyed. Um, for device, image view has not been destroyed. Okay, yeah, so we're finally getting our not destroyed correctly errors. Phew, okay. Right, nice, okay. Great, so we've now got our image view. We've got our swap chain. We've got our underlying images. If we go back to our, um, where is it? We go back to this example here. We've nearly got everything referenced. Um, like if we go to our main loop, We've nearly got everything referenced, right? Uh, well, we haven't got our fence, and uh, we haven't got our semaphores, but those are, like, they take literally no time. Um, we haven't got our render pass, and we haven't got our command buffers. Um, but what does, you know, like, uh, one of the things the render pass does is it targets a specific frame buffer here, right? And the frame buffer is just a way of stacking a bunch of images together. Um, so one way of thinking about it is if you had a color target um, and a depth target, you could stack those together to get uh, a frame buffer with just those components. Or if you're doing something like a, a G buffer, I might just quickly pull that one up. Right, you can combine these four things together um, and that's one frame buffer um, and so a, a render pass targets one individual frame buffer with you know 
the idea being um, that you're trying to render to all of these individual color targets at the same time, uh, and you can get sort of more advanced with lazy allocated uh, images and all that stuff. It's not, we don't really need it at the minute, but what we want to use that for is to place all of those images into a frame buffer. Uh, just for our convenience. So VK frame buffer. <laughs> frame buffer. Create info. Frame. And that is equal to. See, S type. I think I saw a shit ton of members there as well. Frame. Buffer. Create info. Nice. Oh dear lord. Okay. Um, <laughs> attachment count. Uh, there's one attachment uh, because it's just the you know the on-screen color attachment. If you're using a G buffer, you would have four attachments. Uh, pointer to the attachments, and that is the image view. So we'll need to set those in a loop. Uh, while we're creating each of the individual frame buffers. Oh, it takes the render pass now? Okay, that's frustrating. Um, equals... Okay. Let's go and make the render pass instead. I know, mean, the render pass takes a bunch of crap as well. Um, so, yeah. We'll now make the render pass. I'm trying to think if maybe there's a nicer way to like take a break from the swap chain setup perhaps um but because I am getting a bit bored of the swap chain setup stuff um but you know what no 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 we shall stick with this int start up render pass yeah Uh, pointer VK boom main yeah. boom boom dun 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 bum bum and finally uh Uh, and null pointer check. Turn on null. Okay. okay cool. So, first we need the render pass. Okay. Render pass. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. S type. Can you tell I'm starting to get tired? <laughs> At the very least, my pinky is starting to get tired from constantly holding down the shift button. What other members are there? Attachment count, dependency count, flags, attachments, um, dependencies, subpasses, subpass count. Okay. Um, I want to check in here. Okay, so what things do I actually use? Uh, so dependencies. Um, that's if you've got a render pass. So render passes can depend on each other. For instance, you write out to a render pass uh, for the G buffer. Um, and then the next render pass that sort of collapses those together, that actually then has to um, be dependent on the G buffer pass, if that makes sense. So in order to get the G buffer pass uh, working properly or the the resolve working properly you need to make the resolve dependent on the g buffer creation so you have these things called subpar uh 
render pass dependencies and those for like external render passes and then you have things called sub passes within a render pass and a sub pass is where you're doing different things but targeting the same frame buffer it is like i said um the thing with vulcan is is you're creating something that targets as many platforms as possible and so as a result it gets very verbose very quickly um, so looking at that pre-made one that I had earlier we target the attachments and we target the subpasses okay so dot p attachments null for now uh, attachment count equals to one and subpass count equals to one subpasses no, okay. Okay, so now let's fill in those structures. So the P attachments, <laughs> the P attachments, <laughs> that's so stupid. Oh my God, that's so stupid. I'm, s oh my God, why is that funny? This isn't the right, Oh, I see what happened earlier. It took me to the wrong... It took me to the wrong fucking member. So I actually have to do it that way instead. Okay. Um, anyway, attachment descriptions. Peak definition. Oh, wow. Okay. A lot. Um, thing we can't do. Okay, so... Description for the attachments. So, ah, there's no S type. Thank fuck. Uh, so, VK sample count. We're not doing multi sampling. So, just one, please. Format. We have the format from uh, the swap format. Oh, voice crack. Wow. Okay. Um, so, the initial layout that's the layout at the start of the render pass um so since it could be anything we actually don't care so it um uh, vk layout no vk image layout i want to say like unknown undefined there we go uh, so at the start of the render pass we don't really care. Um, does this have final layout? Yep. So once we finish the render pass, we want our little color target um, to be able to be shown to the screen. And that has a different layout. So VK image layout. Ooh. VK image layout. Uh, it's not color attachment option. It's present source khr so the idea here being is when the render pass ends it'll automatically transition our color target from whatever it was before into a presentation layout um and that's why i kind of i don't like to use dynamic rendering because dynamic rendering one of the new instance extensions um you have to explicitly do this which the render pass does for you so you would have to instead use a barrier this is kind of like an implicit barrier um when we first load uh this particular attachment into memory we've just received it and we want to clear it uh vk load attachment load op um clear right so we want to set the clear color when we first load this attachment and then when we're finished with it we want to keep it uh, because it's going it's going onto the screen right so attachment uh, store operation uh, where's the store there we go store it um, is there anything else in here final layout there's no stencil on this. Okay, I think that might be everything for us on the attachment. Um, but we can simply find out by setting this and going VK create render pass. 
takes a device, takes the create info, takes an allocator, and then a pointer to render pass itself. Uh, in our case, doesn't actually exist yet, but we'll add it in over here. Yeah. Nice. And of course, um, I'm going to return on VK as well. Okay, nice. So, required parameter subpasses. Okay, yeah. So, we deliberately haven't set the subpasses information yet. Um. But that does seem to describe, because we didn't get an error, I think the attachment description is actually okay. Uh, which is fantastic. Uh, VK subpass description, peak definition. Uh, once again, an uh, absolute shit ton of members, but it's okay. Does this have an S type? No. Fantastic. Color attachment count. One color attachment. Does it take a pointer to uh, P color attachments? It fucking does. Attachment reference. So we need another thing. <laughs> uh, VK attachment reference, which is apparently different from an attachment description. Okay, whatever you say. Uh, attachment. What are you a pointer to? Ah, that's the index. So you can you need to be able to identify your attachments by their index. So which one is attachment zero, which one is attachment one, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you're doing a G buffer, you would maybe store the albedo in the zero attachment. Uh, normal in the first attachment, and then this is where you would sort of specify that. Uh, but in this case, we're not. So, swap format. Um, and yeah, that's fine. Um, dot p color attachments to, to the Pointed to the reference. Uh, what else it goes into the subpass member? Input attachment count. I think that's probably going to be zero. Pipeline bind point. PK pipeline bind point graphics because it's getting used in the graphics queue rather than being used in the compute queue. And I think that might be it. And that might be the only thing we need to specify. We um, shall find out. Where have I put? Ah. Need to move those up. Render dot subpasses subpass. Okay. Create info subpass color attachment zero dot layout does not fall within the begin end range of the core VK. Ah. Interesting. So I feel like I'm mixing up my layouts instead. Let me see. Uh, peak definition. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, I was using format, not layout. Okay. Oh, sick. Render, <laughs> Render pass works. Nice. Cool. Uh, yeah, and as you can see, 
I've given up on destroying them. Um, but anyway, now let's pack those attachments finally into the frame buffer. Create info, frame buffer equal to dot s type. So you can see sort of like how the frame buffer and the render pass are linked, right? They each kind of like depend on each other, um, which I guess is a bit weird, but I, the mm, that's kind of what uh, dynamic rendering is trying to fix, but. I feel like using specifically like a weird extension that changes the behavior is maybe something for not your first ever Vulcan tutorial. Um, so we'll keep it nice and simple. Oh, another attachment member. Great. I'll here. Height is equal to VK extent swap extent dot height dot width swap extent dot width layers. What's a layer? No, I'm going to set it to zero. Anyway, and what was the final thing we needed to fill in? It was that attachments member. Ah, and that's the image view, of course. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, so we need, um, enough frame buffers. BK frame buffer. Uh, frame buffer. Cool. Oh, I promise we are getting somewhere. I definitely promise. A hundred percent. Do I already? No, okay. Cool. Uh, VK frame buffer is equal to malloc. VK swap count times by size of VK frame buffer return on null. DK frame buffer for u in thirty two dash t where's swap count uh, again so once again frame buffer dot p attachment so it's a pointer to an image view probably because you can attach multiple attachments but in this case that means we just go vk swap views plus i turn on vk uh, vk create frame buffer let's see vk device followed by the create info, followed by the allocator, followed by the points to the frame buffer, which in this case is once again, we can use the plus i method. Ah. Requested frame buffer layers must be greater than zero. Okay, one. Nice. <laughs> cool. Fantastic. Oh. So, we're nearly there, right? 
we're getting somewhere. The final thing that we're going to need to create is the command buffer, which need the command buffers, which needs a command pool, and then we're going to need a per sync uh, synchronization objects. And so this um, asks us that we specify how many frames we want in flight because we need a sync object for each frame in flight, and we need a command buffer for each frame in flight. So frames in flight, two I believe is the standard, um, and then we shall now have our vk command pool, pool, vk command buffer, uh, command, that's an array of command buffers, we need a vk fence, fences, K semaphore. Um, I like to use like semaphore ready, and then semaphore finished. So we go back to before finished. Cool. So if we go back to B four. Uh, We need these sync objects, um, and this was a nightmare to explain, and I honestly don't know if it's even vaguely comprehensible, um, but at this point, I don't care. Um, so the render pass is done. Um, next thing we need is a int, what's it called? Frame buffer. No, not frame buffer. Um, I was literally just there. Uh, start up command buffers. Yeah, sure. Lock and info start VK. Cool. This is nearly, nearly going to be it, I think. Uh, so once again, turn on null uh, vk, uh, turn zero. Okay, cool, cool means. So let's create the command pool. Uh, so vk command pool. I believe the rest of like these objects are fairly simple. BK command pool. Uh, so, what is a command pool? It is a section of memory where you can create command buffers from, which sort of um, sounds self explanatory. Um, um, I'm trying to think like uh, the reason is is because you can like create a bunch of frames, um, a bunch of command buffers. So if going back to that earlier point, the um, the idea that you can have secondary command buffers, so you can have like a, an absolute shit ton of those, and you can be creating them, destroying them, resetting them. So you want like a set section of memory for this. Uh, flags uh, for VK uh, command pool. Reset, I think. There's like a command pool, there's a flag I think I need to set, but I can't remember what it is. Oh well. Um, <laughs> uh, Q family index, remember once again, we're assuming it's all in zero. Um, turn on VK. Cool. Um, and this is VK create command pool uh, VK device VK not even VK. It's our pool info. Then it's a null pointer. Then it's VK man. Uh, let's call it pool. Yep. 
and I'm fairly certain that'll just be fine. Uh, so now we need a command buffer for each frame in flight and then also the same with the sync objects. Uh, so I'm just going to malloc them all here, uh, just save myself some time. Uh, so frames in flight, time scale size of pk command buffer. pk uh, cmd equals that pk uh, fences is equal to pk fence pk semaphore ready semaphore Do the same for the image. Finished. Okay, cool. And then I need to null point to check all of them as well. Or otherwise I'll get warnings and they'll annoy me. Uh, so turn on null. Turn on null. And we turn on null, BK semaphore ready, and turn null, BK semaphore finished. And cool, right, so that is all of our allocations done. Uh, kind of a pain in the ass, but we're done. And so now we need to, so allocating a command buffer is actually a little bit different from all of the other Vulkan objects because you're allocating it from a pool instead. So it actually is a VK command buffer allocate info rather than a create info. I know, exciting. Um, still has that S type, VK structure type uh command buffer allocate info uh command pool is equal to vk pool because so we're getting it from that pool uh level is a vk command buffer level primary because we're not it's not like a secondary one um and we're actually going to do these all in one go so vk command pool count is vk no it's not vk it's image in was it frames in flight that's it frames in flight um what else so yes it is actually in the command pool that i need to set so basically by default command pools aren't resettable or sorry command buffers that are allocated from a command pool aren't resettable so instead you actually need, where is it in here? No, this doesn't have a flag. So yeah, you need to set it so that the um, command buffer from allocated from this pool can be reset. So VK command pool reset release resources bit maybe? I wonder which one it is. Uh, it's not transient bit. Um, let's just see, because I believe this is the only point that I actually set a flag in our pre-baked one. Not in the selection, in the current document. Nope. VK command ball create reset. Ah, nearly. Nearly, nearly, nearly. Um, anyway, so... Now let's allocate all of those in one go. So return on VK, uh, VK allocate command buffers, uh, VK device, allocate info. And we don't need our device callback because we've already got it in the pool. So uh, VK uh, command 
Buzz. Cool. Nice. Whew. And now we need to create the semaphores and the fence. So VK fence create info. Thank God is actually these are nice and small. Uh, fence equal to S type VK. Uh, right. Let's create info. And we do also want to set the flag of, uh, so when we create this fence, we want this fence to already be signaled because we haven't got previous frames ahead of us to signal these. So when we create these frame, uh, these fences, we want them to already be in a signaled state. So VK fence create signaled bit or else we'll sort of wait on them forever. Um, VK semaphore create info semaphore is equal to VK. Um, is there anything else that needs to go into the semaphores? I don't actually think so. Four. Semaphore create info. Flags? No, there's no flags. Cool. Lovely. And then in a loop. Uh, length. So that is VK uh, swap count. No, it's not swap count. These are per frame in flight, not per image index. Um, so frames in flight and turn on VK, VK create fence. Uh, P fence. Uh, VK fences plus I turn on VK fences four device semaphore create info null and a pointer to the semaphore as well. So that is VK. Semaphore ready, and we'll just copy that. Wait. Mm -hmm. Semaphore finished. This never gets called. Uh, but, 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 so let me call this in main. Okay, lovely. Huzzah! Fantastic! Now we can actually record a frame. Yay! Okay, so what's the best way to do this? We need to keep track of uh, our frame and flight index. So I might even just make it a static member inside of the Vulcan. Yeah, uh, record frame. And of course that takes a VK. Uh, a Vulcan. Okay, cool. And then every frame we're going to, while it's still open, record a frame. Awesome. So, 
there is one last thing to do here, which is actually recording our commands that we place into the command buffer. Fantastic. Right, so then, um, what do we do first? Oh, hello. Sorry, there's uh, police cars going by. Um, so if we go back to the one we made earlier, uh, reset. <laughs> okay, uh, do I keep this open? Uh, we need our static uh, uint32-t uh, sync index. So this is sort of keeping track of um, the frames that are currently in flight. Um, and that's, that's kind of like our, our frame index, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. But because it specifically refers to the sync objects, I'm calling it the sync index. Um, so of course, we wait for the frame. So if you remember earlier, we VK wait for fences, um, VK device, fence count, just the one, please. VK uh, fences plus I uh, wait on all of them. Yes. And the timeout is how long we wait on that fence before we just say, nah, screw it, um, or return a failure. And uh, the easiest way to do that is just to use the maximum time, which is minus one. Um, because if you bit cast minus one, uh, it'll turn into just all ones. Um, so if we remember going back to here, we're waiting on the fence. Um, so we're sort of waiting for this command buffer to be finished reading. Uh, so going back, and then we need to acquire the swap chain. Uh, so we need to put a command in the command buffer, which is telling the command buffer not to go until the image is uh, no longer being displayed. Uh, so VK acquire next image. Let's get VK device, uh, VK swap chain, timeout is once again minus one. The semaphore is the VK uh, image ready because it's ready to be rendered to. Um, the fence is uh, a null handle because we don't want to sync this back to the CPU. That's wasteful. And then the image index. So uint32-t swap index and that is going to tell us so this is the only thing that we're actually getting back from the gpu is, well we're not even getting it back from the gpu we're getting it back from the vulcan implementation and this will tell us which frame buffer to target so this stops the um for instance the sync index and the frame and the uh, the current frame buffer might get out of sync so we want to make sure that we actually get, you know, the next uh, frame, the frame buffer to target and therefore the next image to target and so on and so forth. So VK reset command buffer because, you know, we want to, we, we don't want um, whatever was in that command buffer previously. So, uh, VK CMD, uh, sync index. Nope, not whatever that was. And don't care about the flags. Um, VK, and now we want to begin the command buffer immediately after resetting it. So begin info, begin is equal to, uh, what's in here. Just an estimate VK structure type begin. Uh, no, let's be command buffer begin info. Oh my god, was I right? Yes, that's a miracle. 
Um, do we care about any of these? I don't think we do. No, that's all good. Okay, cool. Based. Um, VK begin command buffer. Uh, VK command buffer. So we're basically just. I don't know even why this needs a begin info, but whatever. Um, so to summarize, what all of this is doing is we just wait for that command buffer, uh, reset it once it's we've got it, um, and then begin it as new, basically. And that needs to be appointed to the swap index so we can actually receive it. Um, okay, so what value do we want to clear the swap chain uh, to or the image? Uh, clear value, clear. let's set it up. I Previously I used red, so let's not use red. RGB, I want uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then the alpha channel needs to be on all the time. Uh, so we've got nothing in red, half green, half blue, and fully alpha on. I don't think this actually matters because we're using an opaque swap chain. Um, but hopefully that will give us purple, I think. Do I remember my primary colors? Probably not. Um, now we need to begin our render pass. Uh, which of course takes an S type, VK. I wish this could have been shortened, you know, like VKST or something, maybe. Uh, VK structure time, render, pass, come on, two times in a row? No, okay. Ah, space between render and pass, god damn. Um, so pass in that clear count uh, using the clear values pointer. So clear, and there's only one of them. If you had more render targets to clear, so if you were clearing a G buffer, you would need to clear each one of those, and each one would need their own clear value. Frame buffer. Uh, so that's that thing we created earlier, BK frame buffer. And remember specifically, we're targeting the swap chain index, not the sync in index, because these two can come out of sync. Um, what's next? Uh, render pass. So we already have that set up nicely for us. Render pass. And then we have the render area. And that has an extent, which we already have. Swap extent swap extent um and then just the offset render area dot offset uh is equal to dot x is equal to zero render area dot offset dot y is also equal to zero and do i have anything else i don't think so i think that is in fact everything Okay, so VK command begin render pass. Uh, and VK command, and we're using the sync index. Um, render pass info and VK sub pass contents in line. Um, so because we're not actually sharing anything externally from the subpasses, they're just like in line. Um, I think maybe this changes if you use a secondary command buffer. I'm not honestly all that sure. Um, and now we can just simply end it here. Here is where you would like submit like vertex, submit graphics work. 
uh, I don't know, like render some triangles or whatever the fuck we're doing here. Um, but because we're not actually interested in any of that, we're just going to do command end render pass. Uh, and VK command sync index. Nice. VK command end command. No, uh, VK end command buffer. And this is probably where we want to put a, uh, a check on it. Um, because, um, none of these will actually usually return an error, but once, um, you finish it, it sort of then does like a validation of your command buffer being valid. Uh, so uh, turn on VK, boom, boom, boom. I want you in my room. And that's the end of the command buffer. Cool. So now we need to submit that command buffer. If you remember, we are now here. Um, so, VK submit info. So, shockingly enough, everything's an info. Uh, submit uh, S type is equal to VK structure type. Legitimately, my pinky is getting tired from holding the down shift. Um, Submit info, command buff account is one. Uh, P command buffers is equal to VK CMD plus sync index. What else? Uh, and okay. so what semaphore do we want to wait on? Um, and you, uh, you'll remember correctly that we want to wait on this one up here. So we want to wait on the image to be ready. Uh, so wait semaphore. Um, that needs to be offset by the sync index. And that is making me think, does this take a pointer to a semaphore? Uh, it does not. So sync index, there we go. That was nearly an error. Thank God. Uh, we're only waiting on the one. And so when this submit is finished, we need to tell someone that we finished. So we need to set the signal semaphore off. So semaphore finished plus sync index. And there is only one of these again. Uh, signal semaphore count is equal to one. And then when do we actually signal that stage or like at what stage in the pipeline do we actually do that? Uh, so the wait destination mask. So this is saying like um, the signal semaphore is uh, signaled when <laughs> the, this one of these wait destinations in the pipeline has been hit. Um, so we need a VK pipeline destination flag, VK pipeline stage flag, well, maybe, um, destination and it's, I think it is VK um, instead of umming and ahhing, let's actually look. Um, we want to, okay, yeah. Pipeline stage flags, yeah. Uh, so basically we're saying when we hit uh, the color attachment output bit, i.e. the uh, pipeline has hit the point where it's actually outputting the um, the color attachment, so it's finished rendering and it's now getting passed on to the next step, or it's like finished resolving, all that stuff. It's basically, we can say it's definitely finished rendering here. And that is when we want to signal the semaphore. And wait destination 
Do I not have to specify the weight destination count? Is that just... Okay, no, we don't. Okay, cool. Um, cool, okay. Based, uh, VK graphics, uh, no, VK queue submit. Ah, we're missing our queue. So I'm just going to put a null in there. Uh, one queue um, submit. And do we signal offense? We do. We signal, remember, uh, going back to this diagram. When the graphics is finished, we need to signal this fence so that the next time round, the next frame, uh, we can actually wait on this. Okay, lovely. Um, so VK uh, fences and sync index. Okay, cool. Oh my god. So now we need to present the results. Actually, no. Let's make those cues now, actually, instead of this. Um, uh, VK queue graphics. No, it's just a queue. Graphic queue graphics. And VK My spelling is getting worse. Uh, Q present. I'm going to go all the way back up to. Uh, I think it's when we got the device because we specify the device cues in here. Yep. Um, what's this doing here? Like, return on null VK. Okay, um, VK get Q, VK get device Q maybe? Oh my god, based, uh, VK device, Q family index, we know that's going to be zero, and the Q that we're getting is in VK uh, graphics Q. And we should probably just double check the result on that. And oh, doesn't like that for some reason. It's because that doesn't return. Okay. Ah, fuck! I hate when I do that. Um. So apparently that one doesn't actually return a VK result. So we can just. Hmm. Present Q as well. Oh, Q index. Oh, uh, I don't know, zero? Yeah, sure, whatever. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Probably isn't correct, but we'll see. Uh, VK graphics queue. And then finally, we need to present. So present info. Present is equal to, let me guess, S type, VK structure type present. Come on, we're nearly there. Not present info, but I really do. <laughs> <laughs> VK structure type resent info. Oh my god, it's true, it's me. Um, so we need to tell it what swap index we were on. Um, don't care about the result. P swap chains, we're only targeting one swap chain. Uh, so VK swap swap chain. Swap chain count should be one. Do I need that image indices? No, I don't need to store anything there. Uh, and the weight semaphores. So the weight we're waiting on. So before we can present, the image needs to be finished rendering. So that is the image uh, VK semaphore finished rendering. Um, 
plus the current sync index as well. And there is only one weight semaphore. Okay. VK present Q VK Q present KHR okay um, and we're presenting to the present Q uh, Q present and present and then I think finally the last thing we need to do is update the sync index for the next frame. So sync index is equal to sync index plus one, and we take the modulo of that. Okay, uh, frames in flight. Come on. No! <laughs> no! Oh, that's so close. That's so close. Uh, validation errors. Um, VK validation fence must be unsignaled. Huh? Isn't that the whole point of the fence? Wait, hang on. Oh God. Okay. What are we missing? So this Q submit is uh, if the fence is not PK null handle, the fence must be unsignaled. We are unsignaling it, right? Because we're Wait for. We've waited for the fence. Now we need to reset it. <laughs> it's a stupid mistake. Uh, fence count one. Fan fucking tastic. Oh my god. It's there. I also don't know my primary colours apparently. Um but there we go. All of that work to get a clear colour. Oh but what a colour it is. Fan fucking tastic. Okay. So this probably isn't very exciting. I can't imagine it would be. Um, so, and probably always a good thing to check um, to make sure that you're actually presenting the right thing is you should probably change something, you know, anything per frame. Um, and the best way I know to do that is to use um, HSV values. Um, to alternate the hue on the color wheel. Uh, so static, uh, float, hue, equals zero. Um, let's get the next hue. So uh, hue is equal to U plus uh, 0 0.1 float which, and F modulo uh, and it should be 360 degrees because the hue to RGB conversion doesn't uh, use radians for some reason um, but anyway that means we need to include math.h math.h really wish it was maths.h because there's more than you know we do a lot of mathematics we don't do very much mathematic um but anyway that's just like ripe on my behalf uh so we always make sure that's in range uh and if i very quickly p 
piecewise conversion. Uh, Lord, <laughs> God, I'm losing my fucking marbles here. Um, VK, yeah, actually, we'll go VK clear color, right? That type, VK clear color value. Sure. And I think that just needs to be in the values of what does this not okay. Clear color what what's the okay, apparently it has no members. Okay. Uh so I guess we just Oh. Pressing control again. Now I wonder if that actually works. Um oh well, we'll see. So before we do the clear, uh we get clear colour is equal to and pass in the hue not dot one sorry uh one dot o one dot o does it work no shit unresolved external symbol max oh fuck's sake um what yoink Whatever. Okay. Okay, granted, I did set the um the hue to one. Where's where, where am I setting sorry, the lightness to one. I'm setting Where the fuck am I setting the clear colour again? I'm I'm losing my marbles here. Um not point five not point five. There we go, look at that. Okay, that's a bit quick. Um Okay, that's a bit slow, but anyway. That's our final end result um, for now, at the very least. Uh, we have something that is clearing the screen through the GPU and displaying it to Windows um, via Vulkan. Um, and it only took multiple hours. How many hours? Oh my god. Okay, quite a few hours. Um, so yes, um, in conclusion, I can definitely understand why people think that Vulcan is too verbose, or they have a lot of trouble sort of getting over that initial boilerplate, because there is a lot of boilerplate to get set up. Um, what you'll find is there's a lot of Vulcan helper libraries out there, and at some point I do actually plan on creating my own like helper library, which sort of will be hopefully more useful to some people, but I'm not a hundred percent sure that I will be able to create that. Um, but from here, you can then go on to sort of more easily look at stuff, say like um, you know, the vertex and the fragment shaders, um and that will i i definitely recommend looking at vulcan tutorial um i think what i'll do is i'll put this up in a git repo and so you can sort of read alongside it step by step if you are so inclined um i wouldn't be <laughs> um 
but if there was something that maybe you couldn't read or something that you necessarily uh, didn't follow along with, I think the code should be sort of accessible to you. I'll also include the diagrams um, if you think they were of any use to you at all. Um, yeah, uh, I think maybe I might continue this on and go on to the, like, the actual graphics pipeline. I don't know, I'm not sure if it's really worth it because there is the Vulcan tutorial and you can like go from there. Um, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, anyway, so goodbye and let me know if there's anything I can do better. Um, if there's any like thing else that you maybe wanted to see or if there's anything that you thought needed clarification. Um, bye, Z, bye.